Okay, it is November 9th, 2021. My name is Emma Maggard. I'm with the Indiana Jewish Historical Society, and I am lucky enough to meet again with Ms. Fran Ottenheimer. Um, so let's pick up where we left off last time. You were about to tell me how Abe Ottenheimer moved to Indiana. Oh, well, I don't know the real reason, but he moved to Abe, Indi Indiana. Abe moved to Indiana, and he lived in Hammond, and he had a furniture store there. So he decided he wanted to become a lawyer. So there was a judge in town, Judge Ibo, and he went to study law with him at night. That time, I guess you didn't need a college degree. So he did, and he became a lawyer and decided, well, Hammond had too many lawyers. So he then went to East Chicago and he opened up his law practice there, became very well known, very influential. Um, in fact, he and several others started a bank and then during the uh, depression, the bank closed, but they paid off all the creditors and everything. He was nominated by the Republican party for, to be ambassador to some South American country. I don't know which one, but um, anyway, that's, that's what I know about Abe. Yeah. And he was my husband's great grandfather great grandfather so roughly time period he was my husband's grandfather my son's great grandfather right okay okay yeah. so several generations back and that's when the lawyers start in your family right right and then my father-in-law was a lawyer and then my son's a lawyer and then one of my grandsons all Ottenheimers so yeah I'm so he originally moved for the furniture business. And then once he got to Hammond, he decided he wanted to do law. Well, he, while he was still in the furniture business, that okay. was providing a living for him until he okay. could be a lawyer. Yeah. Okay. But Very interesting. Anyway, um, it's an old family here in town, but here in, it was in East Chicago, of course. East Chicago and Gary are not the same as when I came to the region. I came to the region in 1951 and Gary was an absolutely viable, wonderful city as was well Hammond. And mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately it isn't anymore, but it was then and it was, yeah. things have so changed. So tell me a little bit more about that. Um, I understand there's a, a large, or at one point, there was a large steel industry in Gary, and that kind of was in Hammond as well, and lots of entrepreneurial ventures. Well, you're, um, United, wait a minute, I think, what was the steel company? You know, Inland Steel was in East Chicago, mm -hmm. and, and U.S. Steel was in uh, Gary, and they were two separate companies. But the whole economy here, unfortunately, was based on one business. And in the, in the late 70s, 19, in the 1970s, the late part of that decade, uh, the, you begin to see signs that the industry is not doing as well. The foreign steel mills are doing better. And uh, from then on, everyone who was employed in the steel mills at that time and er almost everybody you met was uh they the um population of the people employed there went down drastically and the economy here suffered a great deal and i think it's bounced back somewhat but you don't see many especially in the Jewish population, many new young people coming to live here, uh, unless maybe they're doctors and they wanna uh, establish a practice here, or maybe there's a family business. But aside from that, there's very few young people moving to this area. So maybe okay. with, I was gonna say, you know, the South Shore is coming to Dyer and Cherville and, mm -hmm. Lowell, and maybe when it comes this way and transportation to Chicago will be so much easier and prices in Indiana are so much better, maybe then there will be an influx. But as of now, it is, there's none. Not so. much. Um, so when it was a, a booming economy and a, a kind of more busy place to live when you moved there in the 50s, what are some of the, the top industries that were happening? Can you tell me a little bit about your neighborhood? Because you moved 
it was originally East Chicago and then you moved to Hammond, correct? And then oh, the oh, Cherville? I moved to Munster. Munster. From okay. I, I moved to Chicago, I think two and a half years mm. or two years, something like that. Then I moved to Munster and I lived in Munster 40 years. Okay. And then I, I just live across the line in Cherville now. It's it's really close to Munster. So, but, uh, and East Chicago has changed drastically. When I first moved to East Chicago and lived there, my husband knew everybody. So he said to me, Fran, just walk down the street and say hi to everyone. And I did, and everyone said hi to me. I had no idea to whom I was speaking, but anyway, I remember the South Shore train which is our way to get to Chicago, ran right down the middle of the street in Chicago Avenue, the main street in East Chicago. And so I got on, I got down, and the gentleman next to me said, would you like to read half of my newspaper? Well, that was so alien to me coming from New York. How could they do that? But that's the way people were. They were friendly, outgoing. It was a wonderful county and a wonderful town. I really enjoyed living here very much yeah. not pretty there wasn't aesthetically geographically pretty but the people made it nice yeah. it's important to have a good good people in your community right right but anyway you want to know about jewish history so i'm not helping you too much am i no you definitely are it's all about the communities and being a jewish person within a community um it sounds like there is a lot of integration that wasn't really a uh, a need to separate and only communicate with Jewish people. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely. But I will say downtown Hammond in those days, I would say the bulk of the <coughs> stores that were doing very well were all owned by Jewish people. Mm. Uh, uh, there was uh, Rothschilds, there was Rosalie, there was Nagdemans, all three dress shops. And okay. Sam Sachs shoes and Irving Byrne had a shoe store, all these, and they all, from all outward appearances, did very well. And as as I say, it was a very viable community with lots of shopping. We had Goldblatt's there, which was a great store. We had minuses there, all big department stores. And now, of course, there's very little. Yeah. How how long were those operating in business? Oh, I guess a, a long, a Goldblatt's was there way before I came. Okay. And, you know, I can't pinpoint when things started. Maybe with the steel business going bad in the late 70s, they were there through the 80s. But all those entrepreneurs, those people who were congregants of my temple have all died. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there's, there's, well, most of the people I know, I, because I'm 93, there's so many people have died. And, yeah. you know, I have to ask a question about history. I have a problem deciding I don't know whom to go to to ask anymore. Mm -hmm. But that's my problem. <laughs> uh, and Gary also was a, I had lots of friends in Gary. And really the community there, they offered many more cultural events. It was a much bigger city than Hammond. It was the second largest city in the state at the time. Yeah. Uh, after Indianapolis. And it was a great city, a great city. Unfortunately, well, more than uh, politics also sort of ruined it. You know, I don't know if I'm supposed to say these things, but when Mayor Hatcher was elected, the white population moved out of Gary. So, yeah, it, anytime you have a migration, it, it affects everything. Right, right, right. So, uh, and I'm trying to, I mean, our temple has evolved too, because uh, my husband's grandparents, Abe and his first and second wife were charter members of Temple Bethel. Oh, okay. And, uh, I told you my in-laws, of course, were members and they, I right. told you they during the depression. Yes. And, uh, my husband and I became members, but uh, when I came, they uh, were meeting in a house, which they had bought on Holman Avenue in Munster. And it, it had been a private residence and they turned it into um, 
uh, house of worship. And then they sold to the veterans of foreign wars when they built their other building, a nice large building on Holman Avenue. Okay. But uh, again, when the uh, population changed and the jobs weren't as good and the older members died, uh, they couldn't sustain the building and needed a lot of work by that time was many years old. And then they built a smaller building in Munster, which we occupy now. And it was fine. We had a, a nice congregation, about 240 families, but that slowly has evaporated too. And just this year, we joined uh, forces with um, Anshay Sholem from Olympia Fields because they too have the same problem we are having. No one new and young is coming to the area and people aren't staying or they're dying. So now we're, to, now our building occupy, holds two temples and there's talk of uniting and becoming one congregation. It hasn't happened yet, but it seems to be in the offing. And you know, it, it Certainly, uh, they're coming into our building, paying us rent and sharing half the expenses has kept us going because otherwise, I don't think we would be able to afford it. You know, we share yeah. one rapidly. And so, yeah, there's been such a total change. But uh, yeah. I don't feel the good, but it is what it is. Yeah, it's, it's hard when, when people continuously move away if there's not an right. industry or something to to get new people moving into the communities. And also they die, you know, yeah. unfortunately. Unfortunately. Um, right. You mentioned that your son and your grandson are both also lawyers, is that right. right? But they don't live in the area. Where did they move to? Well, my son lives in Buffalo Grove. My grandson lives in Chicago and, and they each practice independently, so. Uh, okay. Is that something in your family you guys tend to practice independently? Because you mentioned um, no, Ava and Harmer started his own. No, no but um, I'm not sure whether my father-in-law ever went in with his father, but my husband went in with his father. Okay. So, uh, and then my son was with my husband for a while. But as I say, things here in the 70s got really bad. So my son decided this was not the area for him to stay in and rightly so because he graduated i think law school in 72 was no wait a minute he graduated law school in about he got married in 79 he's and uh came here at the end when things were just beginning to go downhill. So he decided that after two or three years, I can't remember the time frame too well, he decided this was not the place for him to be. And it, it, he made the wise decision, I will say. Much as I hated to see him go, it was a wise decision. Yeah, it's always a hard balance because you want your people near you, but you also want, want them to go somewhere where there's a success be level. Happy and successful, you're right, you're right. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I wish you could ask me some questions. I don't know what else to tell you uh, about the area uh, um, of people. Can you tell me about those businesses you named that were on Holman Avenue and um, the businesses, you said there were three dress shops and a department store. Can you tell me more about the people that were, were running those, that were owning those um, Jewish in that area? Sam Denmark was a, a powerhouse. He owned Rothschild. He had okay. bought from somebody else and it was a tremendous success as was he. And he was the one that spearheaded us to start to build a new temple. Um, you know, as I say, we were in a private home that's now the Veterans of Foreign Wars on Holman Avenue. But he was spearheaded the whole building and kept very active in the temple even after he moved to uh, Phoenix and retired. And the others were the Nagdemans, which was also a very well-known family. That was a, uh, and Rose and Carl Rosenthal, who owned Rosalie's. They were all, you know, as I say, uh, and there were many doctors in our congregation. It was a very viable, um, rich congregation, I would say. Yeah, that's great. Um, 
the of the various doctors was it uh, people that were general practitioners and specialists um, well, there were two pediatricians dr arbeiter and dr troy uh none of their kids stayed in the region neither did mine um I'm trying to think. There were people who are high up in Inland Steel who held executive positions. Um, I have to remember names now. Wait a minute. As soon as I stop talking to you, I will remember. But I'm terrible. <laughs> but anyway, they were all members. So, uh, and I remember. Uh, I told you my father-in-law was acting rabbi during the war yes. and they finally were interviewing rabbis and my husband and I happened to come up from college. We weren't married yet when Rabbi Stoya and Edith came for an interview and he conducted a service and I remember that was in 1949. I remember going to the service and he was so young and blonde. He was <laughs> he come from Germany. He and Edith, his wife, a beautiful couple. They had three young little kids running all around. And I guess he was a success. They hired him and he was our rabbi for many years till he retired. So, uh, and then there was a succession of rabbis. Yeah. That's also, interesting. They had someone come directly from Germany. Right. No, well, I think he might have had a congregation here. I don't remember, but something in the back of my mind tells me he might have. Yeah. So I don't know. Very interesting. Um, as, you... as, was, as was the um, conservative congregation, a Plotke, Rabbi Plotke, I can't remember his first name. He too came from Germany and he was their rabbi. They interesting all, trend. They all escaped and they came here and, and found uh, you know, people friendly with opening their arms and, you know, to them. So I think they were happy. Yeah, that's good. Um, having a distinct Jewish community in Northern Indiana, so close to Chicago, right. when you guys were a thriving community, was there a, a very clear distinction between the Indiana Jewish community and the communities of Chicago? Was there much interaction well, there? What? It's mainly we're on the border of Illinois, but it's the south suburbs that we're closest to, like Homewood, Flossmoor, um, Tinley Park, those that, and uh, they really, as far as I was concerned, we really never knew one another. That's why I say now, Anshu Sholem, which has come from Olympia Fields, which is also near Homewood and Flossmoor, and it's joined and united with our congregation. We're getting to know the people, but it's... It's just now happening in 2021. Well, you know what? It will, I think, give them time, but you know, each one wants uh, autonomy. So that's yeah. difficult. Yeah. But anyway, it will happen. Yeah. Oh, we have no choice. We, in order to survive, we have no choice. Yeah. But I understand this is happening with all religions. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, people are not joining organized religion. They're not joining congregations. Yeah, I am hearing that more and more in various sources that that's happening, which is... So, I don't know about you, but it's symptomatic of the times. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of disturbing that people aren't, aren't keeping that tradition anymore, at least I think. Well, uh, our old rabbi, our rabbi emeritus, uh, Michael Stevens, whom we all love, who have retired, would say, you don't, young people don't join a temple until their kids have to go to Sunday school. Then their kids go to Sunday school and they're, they become bat misfit or bar misfit and then they're confirmed. And then they leave the temple and they, but they then come back when they get old because they want to be buried by the rabbi. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Some of us have stayed on, but it seems to be the way. So uh, um, you mentioned bar and bat mitzvahs. Are all your children bat No, my, my son was the first one in the Ottenheimer family ever to be 
bar mitzvah because they were so reformed because in my generation, a religion has changed the way we practice it. Uh, being coming from a reform congregation, we had no Hebrew in our service. We had, it was different, but now it, it seems more like uh, conservative because I am from the old school. Yeah. Those of, um, I remember when my son, my grandsons were being bar mitzvah, my son said to me, mom, it's not like Temple Bethel anymore. Remember, it's not the same. And it wasn't, it wasn't. But all my grandsons have been bar mitzvah and my granddaughter was bat mitzvah. So anyway. The, the shift that's happening. Right, right. And, and that's, I guess, progress or change. I don't know what, whatever you want to call it. So uh, um, let's talk about the 1950s a little bit. Um, when you okay. first uh, moved, so if you could tell me a little bit about the first neighborhood you moved in, um, in East Chicago, and then the one you lived in for 40 years once you moved. <laughs> But I don't, that's not Jewish history. That's personal history. It is personal history. You're, you're part of uh, the community. Well, we moved into the Atlas of Armands, which were pretty, uh, okay. And we lived in uh, East Chicago and I went to work for the East Chicago Library because I had my master's degree in library service from Columbia. So I went to work at the, the East Chicago Library and then, uh, there was a budget crunch and they let me go. So I went to work for the Gary Library, which in its day was a wonderful library. Unfortunately, now it isn't, but it was great. It was great. And then I became pregnant. My husband graduated law school and we bought a house in Munster. We built a house in Munster, a little house. And we moved there. And uh, I had both my children in the first house I lived in for 10 years. Then we built a, a much bigger house in a different area in Munster, lived there for 30 years. But my husband died, uh, I was uh, 57, he was 62. And I kept the house for another 10 years, but it was on my kids urging and rightly so, it was becoming too much for me to take care of. So then I moved to a gated community in Sherville where I live now. Uh, 26 years ago. And um, I've been here ever since. I got married again. My second husband died. I had several relationships and I lived with a very nice man for nine years and he died. So I'm a, I'm a great caretaker. I've been through it th three times. I'm retired from that. <laughs> That's what I can tell you. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that you've, you've lost people. Well, it happens. Life happens. It's not all fun and games, unfortunately. I hope you have only fun and games, Emma. <laughs> your life should be wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so these, the, the places that you built houses, were there other Jewish families living in your neighborhood? Was that a factor no, when you were deciding no, where to live? No, they weren't. No, they weren't. We had a totally not the first place. In the second area, there were many Jewish people. It was frankly a more affluent area. The first area, but it was a great area. It was wonderful. Everybody had small young kids like we did. And That's great. <laughs> those, those were wonderful days. You'd send your kids out to play and they decided they were going on a picnic or something. You made them a peanut butter sandwich. So they went out at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. And they came back at five o'clock, but you knew they were safe. They were all yeah. in the neighborhood. They were all together. You don't do that anymore. It was- Sadly one... not. Pardon me? Um, sadly not, that's not the case anymore, but it sounds like a really lovely place to raise children it that was, way. It was great. And for 10 years, it was wonderful. Then we moved to another area. There were some kids there, not as many, but uh, my kids still went out and did things there. You know, there was a creek next door. They played all sorts of imaginative games. It was a really a wonderful life for young people then. I, no one arranged play dates and yeah. anyway, cause I, I now know I watch my grandchildren grow up and now I have three great granddaughters. 
with another with another one in the oven. We don't know if it's a boy or girl. They don't want to know. But I'm watching them, and I'm my great grandchildren go to uh, ballet dances. I mean, they're so structured, but that's the way of life. Yeah. So, anyway. very structured now. Right, right. But uh, my second area had a lot of Jewish families, and we I remember the big snowstorm of '67, which you weren't alive for. But we were all in the house, and someone down the block decided to have a party so we all got snowshoes on dressed up warmly walk, walked down you couldn't drive the roads were impassable right. and we just had a party i mean it was kind of fun when you think about it yeah it'll sound fun so anyway but that's not jewish history i feel i'm i'm falling down on the job i don't know what else to tell you no not at all because like what what we're trying to collect here is just people's experiences it's public history you happen to be jewish so that's what makes it jewish history is you're someone's perspective I thought, on i thought this was particularly because jewish history it isn't so well it, i work for the indiana jewish historical society so there is a focus but it's yeah. all about the actual people it's not like we're doing jewish strictly oh. synagogue history temple history it's um yeah. it's all about the individuals making up communities so just the right. fact that you are a jew yourself and you're involved in in temple bethel that's that's all the context we need is because we're just wanting to hear about what was it like growing up in this area as a Jewish individual? Oh, it was, it was for me. I, well, I didn't grow up here. Well, raising your family. Raising, well, I was young. Uh, when Rabbi Anid Stoya came and I came here, I was 19. Mm -hmm. I got married when I was 20. You roll your eyes. My grandchildren roll your eyes. Who gets married at 20? But That's how it was done. That's how it was done. But, and you know what? I had my children so late in life, so late. I was 26. And that was really old to have your first trial. But I did. But anyway, no, it was a great, a great time. I loved every minute of it. I had a great life. So unfortunately it ended a little earlier than I thought it would, but it is what it is but I'm lucky I have two kids who got married to wonderful people I have five grandchildren and they're all, all but one is married and he's engaged and he will be married uh next October I have three and a half great grandchildren so what more can I ask for you yeah, sounds like you have a wonderful family a wonderful I, life you've made I do I do, and I have a lot of great friends, and I'm lucky because I have a lot of friends in in their 90s, which you know is rare. I guess it's it's more typical these days. People are living longer. Yeah. So I do think that the age expectancy is getting higher, which is good right. to hear. Um, right. Right. Happening. It's nice for you to know. Yeah. You know, <laughs> right. Well, and we get to we get to talk to people that have been around longer, and it's it's better historical perspective to talk to the actual people. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But I'm afraid I'm not doing justice to our interview. That's what's worrying me. Well, can you tell me about, um, I've heard with the Temple Bethel community, uh, organizations such as sisterhood organizations and um, different, different social groups that are connected with the temple. Can you tell me some about that? Well, Unfortunately, I've never been active. I got, went to the meetings, but I never was truly active. My mother-in-law was very active. She was temple president, and she also was on the national board of the, so she would go to New York, and she would have to give speeches. And I remember Rabbi Stoya writing her speeches for her mm -hmm. to go. But I told you, my in-laws were super active in all of this. So... Uh, Anyway, so that was pretty good. Yeah, um, the, the conference in New York, is that something that happens every year? I think so. As I say, I'm not active. I haven't kept up yeah. with it to my chagrin, but anyway, I'm not. Uh, but she was very active and she worked hard for it. And I, I, the temple was really their whole life because of the economic conditions and because of their history and everything. And so... In fact, 
a little side story that's very funny that has yeah. nothing to do with anything. When my father-in-law retired and they got a rabbi, the congregation decided they wanted to do something. So they offered him either a television or a sterling silver tea and coffee service. My mother-in-law wanted the sterling silver tea and coffee service. My father-in-law got the television, wanted the television, they got the television. So I, I just thought that was a little bit of nothing. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's nice to hear stuff like that. Like you get something at the end of it. And, and I think they made the right choice. They really loved the television. You know, in those days, the televisions were this big, you know. Right. So anyway, <laughs> they did acknowledge all my father-in-law and mother-in-law's work during those years when there was no a religious leader. So right. anyway, right. and I can't think of, I, I'm, I, I'm stymied. I don't know what else to tell you. No, uh, this is a lot of really good information. I, I hope so. I don't think so. It definitely I mean, is. <laughs> Okay, um, I, I'm, I'm just telling you things have changed. So all the cities that were so great, I'm sure they're great now, but in a different way, yeah. different, you know. Yeah, what, what were like um, a couple of your favorite, your favorite aspects about the city? What to you made it a great place to live? The people, the people, the people. were friendly and, and everything was so accessible, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, and we had, I remember uh, when Woodmar, you wouldn't know it. it so Woodmar Shopping Center was built. Uh, by the way, I'll say it's totally demolished now, but it was the most successful small mall in the United States. Really? And it was great. We'd go there. They had millions of the small shops. The, pe the uh, proprietors of the... Uh, downtown Hammond shops would open shops there. Carson's was the anchor. Carson Perry Scott. Oh, excuse me one minute. Okay. Of course, all. Okay, but um, I forgot my train of thought. What was I telling um, you? The shopping center. What year did it open? Oh. I oh I don't I remember my husband and I went to South America and we went to Machu Picchu and while there we met the son of the developer and he said that was the most successful small mall in the United States wow. and uh, Carson Perry Scott was there it was wonderful and I remember going there often to and then they enlarged it and then nothing and then. Yeah. Like the whole, like the whole area sort of fell apart. Yeah. And, and all of it around the same time that in the Holman Avenue area and right. just kind of a well, mass it, it sort of killed, It sort of killed Holman Avenue too, because mm -hmm. then in Illinois, right in the, across the, the line in Calumet City, which is Illinois, they built a huge shopping mall, River Oaks with Sears, Penny, Carson's and Macy's. Um, it was Marshall Fields then, but yeah. Macy's. And that totally destroyed downtown Hammond. Mm -hmm. So that was another contributing factor aside from the demise of the steel mills. Mm -hmm. I mean, we still have steel mills, but they're not it's, as- Yeah, it's different people working at different industry focus. And everything is robotic now. They don't need all the people to work there. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, it sounds like for a time period there, though, it was a really, really oh, busy, a, good um, place to, to have well, a lot of people, lots of everybody, interactions. Everybody seemed to be doing well, basically some better than others. But, you know, it, it seemed like a really good place. And newcomers came in. And I remember a young family opened up a first store, and I think they did fairly well. And, you know, it, it was it was a nice area. And, okay. and you know what? Everything seems better in the olden days. You know, yeah. something psychological about looking back. And yeah. fortunately, individuals don't remember pain and hardship as much as they remember uh, joy and fun and things like that, which is good, which is good. It is good. 
Oh. It is good to remember it that way. And then from a historical perspective, kind of just taking things with a grain of salt. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one more question about the people that were moving into the area. Were those, did it tend to be other American families from other areas? Was it people from well, international? They, they felt it was a good area to open a business or to be become a, a professional doctor, lawyer, and insurance agent, whatever they did. They felt it was, you know, things were good here. Everything was booming. Yeah. And so they moved in and they affiliated with either conservative or reformed temple. I'm talking about the Jewish people. And there right. were others too, you know, and then there were the very old families who had lived here who had from generations. And it, it was, as I say, a very nice area. Yeah. Not beautiful at all. Not picturesque. Not but, picturesque, but a good community. Right, right, right. So, uh, 